Well, good afternoon and welcome back to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, here for another action-packed episode. Now, if you were watching our show last week, uh, we had to run a replay. Um, we had, um, our producer had a uh, special event to go to um, in his family. Uh, he had a family member getting married, so I want to congratulate our producer for now having a, I believe, son-in-law. Um, so um, I hope you had a good time and I hope everything went well. Uh, but in the meantime, we had to run a replay of our show last week. So we ended up talking about elephants. An interesting thing that developed since we had run our replay show is the fact that there are a couple of news stories that started circulating this past week showing how Al-Shabaab is the largest killer of African elephants. Now, our show that we replayed last week was actually a rebroadcast from April. So we told you that back in April. And only now is the mainstream media starting to take notice. So once again, we're a little bit ahead of the curve. And since we do have 68 weeks left before the next presidential election, we are now down to two presidential candidates that we have not, uh, have not featured yet. And so today is Ohio Governor... John Kasich, who has now entered the fray. Let's take a look at his announcement. Let's take a look at his announcement. I think America needs a trustworthy president. I think America needs a president who would be a leader who unites the country and who doesn't try to divide people, who just like brings them together for issues that matter. We need bold leadership for America, someone who can bring everyone together, someone who everyone can believe. America needs a leader like John Kasich. We need a president who really does love America and is going to look out for American interests. America needs John Kasich! America needs John Kasich! The sun is going to rise to the zenith in America again. I promise you it will happen. I will promise you, I will promise you that my top priority will get this country on a path to fiscal independence, strength, and we will rebuild the economy of this country because creating jobs is our highest moral purpose, and we will move to get that done. I am here to ask you for your prayers, for your support, for your efforts, because I have decided to run for President of the United States. Yes, John Kasich has decided to run for President of the United States. Uh, one thing about uh, the current governor of Ohio, he first really made waves in the political scene back in the 1990s when he was asked to uh, take on the responsibility for um, leading in a, but, uh, I think it was a billion dollar budget cut. I mean, it was a huge. And Newt Gingrich had been elected Speaker of the House in 2005, right after the Republicans had first taken the majority control of that body since the 1950s, I think, in 1960s. It was a long time. And Kasich was the one who undertook the budget process. And as a result, he really got a lot of notoriety because the Speaker worked with Kasich and they got the job done. Kasich left the, um, yeah, in 1993, became the ranking Republican member of the House Budget Committee. In that position, Kasich and other House Budget Committee Republicans proposed an alternative to President Bill Clinton's deficit reduction bill. It was called the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993. I'm not going to get into the details of that other than to note that Kasich and a fellow lead sponsor was a Minnesota Democrat named Tim Penny, who later actually ran, I believe, as uh, governor of the Independence Party. Um, and there were almost three times as much 
uh, cuts as the $37 billion in cuts backed by the Clinton administration. There was $90 billion in spending cuts that Kasich and Penny had led through Congress. That's really where he got his notoriety from. He did run, uh, he took some, uh, a few years off, became a uh, commentator, and then he reemerged as the uh, governor of Ohio. I'm trying to see here. Yeah, it was 2000. He did not um, seek re-election. He left the Congress. And then uh, back in 2010 was when he ran for governor and he won. And what has he done in the last five years in Ohio? He's really revitalized that by doing the same thing he did in Congress. He cut the budget. He really trimmed it back. He put priorities in where to spend taxpayers' money. And that's John Kasich. And we're going to see in just a second here a couple of commentators saying, well, I'm not so sure that sells anymore. On the other hand, when you take a look at the way the federal budget has grown over the last seven years, or really you can even go back uh, for about the, well, about the time Kasich left Congress, the federal budget has just ballooned tremendously. And so maybe having a belt tightener who really was able to get Ohio's economy really, really going again and was uh, largely responsible for the uh, surpluses that we saw in the U.S. budget back in the late 1990s, maybe that's the kind of guy who can get some traction. Well, let's see what a couple of commentators had to say about uh, Mark Halperin is one, uh, one of the commentators. He's the guy on your left, and I cannot remember who the other one is. But let's take a look now at the video, and let's just uh, watch them pick apart John Kasich. We have identified the most interesting parts of the governor's announcement, which was delivered without a teleprompter. Here's the part where Kasich made his case as, a yes, a, compass a compassionate conservative. And how about those that struggle to make ends meet? You know, some people just say, oh, well, just work harder or pull yourself out by your boot bootstraps. I believe in all that. Some people just don't have the fortune that many of us have. If you're drug addicted, we're going to try to rehab you and get you on your feet. If you're mentally ill, prison is no place for you. Some treatment and some help is where you need to be. You're the working poor. We're going to give you an opportunity to take a pay raise and not bang you over the head because you're trying to get ahead. Mark, I'm sure there are people who will call me a squish, but I have to say that when Kasich talks that way, when he talks about his compassion, when he speaks his heart, I find it to be probably the most compelling thing about him and certainly the thing that sets him apart from a lot of the other Republicans most distinctively. And there's no question that it helped get him elected governor of this state and made him a popular and somewhat successful governor. You look at the other governors now, Bobby Jindal, uh, 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 Chris Christie, Scott Walker, they are they are in their states divisive figures. You can travel a lot around those states and try to find a Democrat who feels good about their governor. There's some, but not a lot. In this state, because of language like that, even, even in the day I've been here, you meet Democrats, even if they didn't vote for him, who have warm feelings towards John Kasich. And I think that's a big part of his appeal if he's going to do well in this race. 60% yeah. approval right. rating, hard let's to listen to some more. Some, yeah. yeah, let's listen to some more. This is Governor Kasich talking about his Buckeye State record of governance. A lot of hopelessness here, particularly among the poor and minorities. People said, oh, maybe Ohio's best days are behind them. I thought that was just a bunch of baloney. And I said, not only will we get this budget balanced, but we'll cut taxes. Four and a half years later, $8 billion in the hole, $2 billion surplus. A loss of 350,000 jobs, a gain of 350,000 jobs, and tax cuts, tax cuts of Five billion dollars, the largest in the country. John, when governors run, we talk about can they sell an X miracle, their state's miracle. Is there an Ohio economic miracle or other miracle that you think he can sell to Republican voters? 
Uh, I, well, I do. I think, look, the, the, the Ohio's economic story, uh, the, it's, it, there's a lot of credit to go around. I mean, some of it belongs to the Obama administration and the auto bailout. But look, if you compare it, again, as you did on the earlier thing we just discussed, if you compare it to the state of Louisiana, the state of Wisconsin, the state of New Jersey, compared to other governors, uh, the Ohio economy is miraculous, and it's very strong in case it can make the case that he had a big part in it, and it played a big part in making it that way. The other thing is he is very much of this state. He very much feels the culture of the state, uh, the people of the state, the sports teams of this state. And that, I think, again, if he's going to convince people that there's a narrative of his life, of his personal life and how it matches up with his professional life and in this job, I think Ohio is a big calling card for him. And again, he's passionate about his state in a way that very few governors have ever, I've ever covered are. Well, and look, and just to put, make the obvious point, Ohio, pretty important state to win uh, in the fall of 2016, and John Kasich would have a yeah. reasonable chance of doing that, given how popular he is. Uh, so the Ohio story is big for him. All right, finally, let's get to a final little piece of video here. Here's what John Kasich said about being the budget guy par excellence. And we wrote a budget for the United States of America. And why? Everybody knows me as the budget guy. It's not about numbers. It's about vision. It's about values. And we do not have the right, as grown-ups, to ring up debts to suit ourselves and pass them on to the next generation. We don't have that right. You know what? They said it couldn't be done. They said it was too big, too hard, too much politics. And we proved them wrong again, and we balanced that federal budget. We balanced it. Look, uh, Mark, there's no doubt that John Kasich played a big part in a period of, uh, in, in terms of ba balancing the budget back in the 90s. There's no doubt about that. I have a question about whether that issue is as salient now, given the fact that deficits are falling, given that there are other economic issues that matter more uh, in 2016 as it would have some years in the past. But it is a really important part of his record, and he's right to stress it. And he's right in theory that he knows sort of how to deal with budgets. I just think making that tangible, making that part of an exciting narrative of possibility and optimism, I think it's going to be hard to do. He can argue it. We'll see how he talks about it when he's out there as a full-time candidate. But, but I think that is something he's proud of but difficult to sell politically. Okay, so they didn't tear him apart, at least as much as I had thought they had. But on the other hand, I first watched this clip um, 12 hours ago in the middle of the night, so please forgive me on that one. But the one interesting thing to note is with Ohio, where has Obama exactly helped? You know, ran up. I mean, all those budget savings that Kasich had delivered back in the 90s were all wiped away with the massive borrowings that... President Obama had advocated early in his administration when we were running trillion dollar deficits every single year for like four or five years. And whereas, you know, now the deficits, they've fallen to about the position where President Obama had taken office. But that's not exactly the road to prosperity that we had back when John Kasich was in Congress from uh, the time he took uh, the, the chairman of the Budget Control Committee and ended up working with Tim Penny, I've got to give credit where credit is due, to um, actually bringing us back into a better sense of fiscal health. And so now maybe John Kasich is president. Not so bad of an idea. I could see it. Looking at the Real Clear Politics uh, polls for the Republican Party, Donald Trump, 24% on the average. Ben Carson, 16.3. Uh, Carly Fiorina, 11.8. George, oh, excuse me, George. Jeb Bush, 9.8%. Marco Rubio, 9.3%. Ted Cruz, 6.5%. Chris Christie and Mike Huckabee at 3.5% apiece. And then you have John Kasich. He's up to 3%. Um, and then, of course, following behind him is um, Rand Paul at 2.3. And then uh, George Pataki and Rick Santorum at 0.5. And Bobby Jindal at 0.3. And Lindsey Graham has a goose egg. So that's the current state of the Republican presidential nomination contest. Because in 68 more weeks, we will have a new president. And we are going to take a quick look 
at Christmas. Now, what I what do I mean by that? We count down the Christmas days. Except for me, I'm a big Minnesota Lynx fan. I've been a Minnesota Lynx sports writer for seven years. And this is playoff time. The Minnesota Lynx are in the Western Conference Finals. And for me, it's like Christmas, having a team that you've cheered on for so long actually going places. This is the fifth consecutive year in the Western Conference Finals. And 89 more days until Christmas. So my Christmas is coming a little early, especially if they go on to uh, the WNBA Finals and win another championship here. But let's take a look at a segment called Watch Me about WNBA basketball. I know what you're thinking. You think I can't. You think I can't go as hard as you. Cross you up and go coast to coast. You think I can't train like a beast? Push. Give it everything I have. Gonna take the shot. And still be flawless. You think I can't open doors? Come on. Be legendary. Box her out. Get her to school on time. Show them I care. D you up. Be who I want. Love who I want. Inspire her, her, and him. Take the charge. Sink the J. Make them dance. You think I can't do this, this, and that? All while chasing my dream. Watch me. And game two of the Western Conference Finals is tomorrow, Sunday, 2 p.m. Central Time. Minnesota Lynx have a one to nothing lead in the best of three series with the Phoenix Mercury, and the game tomorrow is at Phoenix. So if Minnesota wins, they become the Western Conference champions, and they go on to the WNBA Finals. If they lose, the series is tied at 1, and then the rubber match will be Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, at Target Center. So for me, it's Christmas. And there's one thing, uh, we just kind of had a late addition to our show today. So got a uh, quick video to show on something that is kind of going on right now. Uh, it's actually tomorrow night, is the fourth of the Blood Moon Tetrad. And we're going to take a quick look right now about the Blood Moons. This month's blood moon, also known as a lunar eclipse, is the final such moon in what is known as a tetrad, and the culmination of the four eclipses has some religious people looking skyward with prophecy in mind. The end of days is being predicted by a host of people, including Jewish mystics, Christian fundamentalists, and self-proclaimed prophets. The so-called blood moon prophecy originally comes from the Hebrew Bible's book of Joel. In it, it says the sun will turn into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. In recent years, Christian ministers John Hagee and Mark Biltz have noted that this year's culminating blood moon will fall on special religious holidays. The last time there was a tetrad was back in the 1900s, and to my amazement, they also fell on the feasts of Passover and Tabernacles, explained Blitz. When I noticed the years these phenomena occurred, my mind began reeling. The last two times there were four blood moons in a row, they happened, first, right after Israel became a nation in 1948, and then again when Israel retook Jerusalem in 1967. Elsewhere, self-proclaimed prophet Reverend Efrain Rodriguez has gained a small online following with his own vision. 
Murphy's written letters to NASA and written extensively online claiming that an asteroid up to 2.5 miles wide will make impact in Puerto Rico around the time of the fourth blood moon, bringing about the destruction of Earth. Paul Odlers of NASA's Near-Earth Object Office is skeptical of Rodriguez's claims. There is no existing evidence that an asteroid or any other celestial object is on a trajectory that will impact Earth, he said in a recent statement. In fact, not a single one of the known objects has any credible chance of hitting our planet over the next century. There is no scientific basis, not one shred of evidence, that an asteroid or any other celestial object will impact Earth on those dates. Well, if an astronaut, uh, an astronaut, if an asteroid hits us in the next week, it's been fun. It's been nice knowing you. Uh, obviously, if NASA says there's nothing going to hit us in the next century, and they even see there's one astronaut, uh, I believe he was a Soviet cosmonaut who, cosmonaut who had a glove that fell off in space, and they're still tracking that. Uh, I was at Cape Canaveral back in 2000, and I actually saw that glove on the radar. So if they're tracking something as small as a glove, I think they'll be able to tell us if an asteroid is going to hit us in a week. So I think Rodriguez is wrong. But as this whole Blood Moon Tetrad stuff has gone on, things have happened. I mean, the last time we had a Blood Moon was when Benjamin Netanyahu came to address a joint session of Congress and they were discussing the Iran deal and Netanyahu was warning not to go through with the deal. In the meantime, President Obama did not listen to Bibi Netanyahu and went ahead with the Iran deal, which has not been finalized yet because of Congress. Now, guess who came to town this week? The Pope, who gave a joint, addressed a joint session of Congress just in time for the fourth blood moon. By the way, the fourth blood moon, if you want to see it from an astronomical perspective, um, keep an eye out on the sky from 7.30 p.m. Sunday night to around midnight. So it's actually going to be, it's a harvest moon. It's uh, the closest the moon comes to the Earth. It's going to be large, and you're going to actually start seeing the lunar eclipse occur sometime around, I think it was 1030 to uh, like 1145. So keep an eye out on the sky tomorrow night because the lunar eclipse is going to be happening in the early evening hours uh, after darkness compared to, of course, uh, some of the previous ones which have actually come up just about daybreak. So uh, you can get up early in the morning back in April and catch it, but uh, you know now before you go to bed you can actually see a uh, very interesting lunar eclipse provided we do not have cloudy skies and that I cannot promise. So speaking of the Pope, let's take a look at somebody who was waiting for him. For 20 years. Yes. Yes, Ken. A lot of our standards are doing nothing. Good. That framed painting over there is what Brumidi submitted to the architect of the Capitol when he was trying to become the painter, the official painter for the house. And uh, so he submitted uh, this sample. That sample is what we got in mind. Where you want to do this? That's no, that's good. Where you start. No, I think <laughs> no, I think no, I, I've got a job to do. I got. They don't want to see our backs. Thank you. 
Your Holiness. Welcome. Glad to, really glad that you're here. Boehner. He's a very devout Catholic and 20 years ago he began inviting the Pope to speak in front of a joint session of Congress. This is of course before he became speaker but many you know many invitations have gone out but finally Pope Francis has given in and accepted that invitation and speaker John Boehner is so happy. As a Catholic Hey, it feels just like Christmas. We even brought our Christmas mug out today to uh, celebrate the occasion. Because for John Boehner, he just got a really big Christmas present. It's something that he's been wanting for years. He wanted to meet the Pope. He wanted to meet the Pope in Washington. And he had a chance to do so. Just like I want the links to go to the WNBA Finals. You know, there's Christmas is early this year. But... Let's hear what the Pope actually had to say in front of that joint session of Congress. I am most grateful for your invitation to address this joint session of Congress in the land of the free at the home of the brave. We know most religion is immune from forms of individual delusion or ideological extremism. We, the people of this continent, are not fearful of foreigners because most of us, because most of us were once foreigners. I say this to you as the son of immigrants, knowing that so many of you are also descendants from immigrants. On this continent, two thousands of persons are led to travel north 
in search of a better life for themselves and for their loved ones, in search of greater opportunity. It is not what we want for our own children. Do unto others as you will have them do unto you. The golden rule also reminds us of our responsibility to protect and defend human life at every stage of its development. This conviction has, has led me from the beginning of my ministry to advocate at different levels the global abolition of the death penalty. And business is a noble vocation directed to producing wealth wealth and improving the world. It can be a fruitful source of prosperity from the area in which it operates, especially if it sees the creation of jobs as an essential part of its service to the common good. We need a conversation which includes everyone, since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. I cannot hide my concern for the family, which is threatened, perhaps as never before, from within and without. Fundamental relations have been caught into question, as is the very basis of marriage and the family. I can only reiterate the importance and, above all, the richness and the beauty of family life. God bless America. Pope, I'm kind of at a loss for words here because, you know, he's a man with a very good heart. He means very well, and when you take a look at the fact that he grew up in Argentina, I can see a lot of the social influences on him. I can understand some of the things that he's passionately for. There are certain things for immigration and environmental problems that may cause more problems than they might solve, and the ramifications of some of the stuff that the Pope would like in in the political arena might actually reap heavier on the poor than on the middle class and certainly you know least on the wealthy. I think his heart's in the right place. I don't necessarily agree with him on certain types of policies. But I am not a Catholic. I am a Protestant. So I will let the Catholics believe in the Pope and um, we'll see what happens. But this is the Blood Moon Tetrad, just a reminder. But now we're going to take a look now at something that also happened right after, um, actually the day after, and that was the Speaker of the House was back in the news again. Let's take a look. We're going to play the entire clip, the entire news conference of what Speaker John Boehner said on Friday. It's My, what a wonderful day. 
I used to sing that on my way to work in the morning. Listen, now, my mission uh, every day is to fight for a smaller, less costly, and more accountable government. And over the last uh, five years, our majority has advanced uh, conservative reforms uh, that will help our children and their children. We're now on track to cut government spending by $2.1 trillion over the next 10 years. We've made the first real entitlement reform in nearly two decades. And we've protected 99% of the American people from an increase in our taxes. And we've done all this with a Democrat in the White House. So I'm proud of uh, what we've accomplished. But more than anything, my first job as speaker is to protect uh, the institution. A lot of you know that, uh, now know, uh, that uh, my plan was to step down at the end of last year. I decided uh, uh, in November of uh, 2010 that uh, when I was elected speaker, that uh, serving two terms would uh, have been plenty. And, uh, but in June of last year, when it became clear that the majority leader lost his election, uh, I frankly didn't believe it was right uh, for me to leave at the end of last year. Uh, so my goal was to leave at the end of this year. So I planned, uh, actually, on my birthday, November 17th, uh, to announce that I was leaving at the end of the year. Uh, but uh, it's become clear to me that uh, this prolonged leadership turmoil uh, would do uh, irreparable harm to the institution. Uh, so this morning I informed my colleagues that uh, I would resign from the speakership and resign from Congress at the end of October. Now, as you've often uh, heard me say, uh, this isn't about me. It's about the people. It's about the institution. Uh, just yesterday, we witnessed uh, the awesome sight of uh, Pope Francis addressing uh, the greatest legislative body in the world. And I hope that uh, we will all uh, heed his call to live by the golden rule. Uh, but last night, last night, I started to think about this. And uh, this morning, I woke up and I said my prayers, as I always do. And I decided, you know, today's the day I'm going to do this. As simple as that. Uh, that's the code I've always lived by. If you do the right things for the right reasons, the right things will happen. And I know uh, good things lie ahead uh, for this house uh, in this country, and I'm proud of what we've accomplished, especially proud of my team. You know, uh, I've been here uh, my 25th year here, and I've succeeded in large part because uh, I've put a staff together and a team together, uh, many of which have been with me for a long time. And, uh, and without uh, a great staff, uh, you can't be a great member, and you certainly can't be a great speaker. Now, I'm going to thank uh, my family for putting up with this uh, all these years. My poor girls, who are now 37 and 35, uh, their first uh, campaign photo uh, was in uh, July of 1981. And so uh, they've, uh, they've had to endure all this. It's one thing for me to have to endure it. I've got thick skin. Uh, but, uh, you know, the girls and my wife, uh, they've had to put up with a lot over the years. Uh, let me express uh, my gratitude uh, to my uh, constituents uh, who've uh, sent me here uh, 13 times uh, over the last uh, 25 years. Uh, you can't get here without, uh, without getting votes. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I, I said this often, people ask me, what's the, what's the, greatest thing uh, about being speaker or about being an elected official. And I said, well, it's the people you get to meet. You know, I've met tens of thousands of people in my own congressional district that I would never have met other than the fact that I decided to run for Congress. And uh, over the years as I traveled on behalf of uh, my colleagues in the party, uh, I've met tens of thousands of additional people all over the country. And uh, you meet rich people, you meet poor people, you meet interesting people. Eh, probably a few boring ones along the way. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of the people I meet uh, on the road, anywhere, uh, could, not be, uh, could not be nicer uh, than, uh, than they've been. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been, really, it's been wonderful. Uh, it's been an honor to serve in this institution. And with that, all right, Junior, go ahead. Mayor, you were noticeably overcome with emotion yesterday. Really? Oh, well, what a surprise. I'm curious, as if you reached this decision last night, if the grace of Pope Francis led you to this decision. Uh, no.
No, yesterday was a wonderful day. It really was. And uh, was I emotional yesterday? Yeah, I think I was. Uh, <laughs> I was really emotional in a moment that uh, really no one saw. Uh, as uh, the Pope and I were getting ready to exit the building, we found ourselves uh, alone. And uh, the Pope uh, grabbed my left arm and, and uh, said some very kind words to me about uh, my commitment uh, to kids and education. And the Pope puts his arm around me and kind of pulls me to him and says, please pray for me. Well, who am I to pray for the Pope? But I did. If it wasn't the Pope, then what was it? Uh, it's, uh, it, listen, it was never about the vote, all right? There was never any doubt about whether I could survive a vote. So I don't want my members to have to go through this. I certainly don't want the institution to go through this. And so, especially when, you know, I knew I was, I was thinking about walking out the door anyway. So it's the right time to do it, and frankly, I am entirely comfortable doing it. Mr. Speaker, I've heard you say before that a leader who doesn't have anybody following him is just a guy taking a walk. That's right. I got plenty of people. I got plenty of people following me, uh, but uh, this turmoil that's been uh, churning now for a couple of months uh, is not good for the members and it's not good for the institution. And uh, uh, if I wasn't planning on leaving here soon, uh, I can tell you I would not have done this. If I, if I may just yeah. continue, there are people who are on the right in your caucus and even outside of this institution who have been wanting you to step down for some time who feel that they have a victory today. Uh, Do you feel that you, that you were pushed out? No. Uh, the members, uh, uh, the, I, I'm glad I made this announcement at the conference with all of my Republican colleagues uh, because uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a very good moment uh, to help kind of rebuild the team. Uh, listen, uh, I feel good about what I've done. Uh, I know that I, every day, uh, I've tried to do the right things for the right reasons and tried to do the right thing for the country. Speaker, how can this not be a moment of turmoil? You said you, you thought about leaving two years ago after it happened, but at the time you said this would have pitched the house in turmoil. You have to keep the government open in a couple of days, debt ceiling, there's going to be... Well, I'm going to be here for another. Leadership. I'm going to be here for another five weeks, and uh, I'm not not going to leave. Uh, I'm not going to sit around here and do nothing for the next 30 days. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I uh, plan on getting as much of it done as I can uh, before I exit. And as a result, though, because does that make it easier in some ways to make some tougher decisions? Maybe relying on Democrats to keep the government open next week. Or no, something? I'm going to make the same decisions. I would have made regardless of this. Mr. Speaker, you've made no secret of your frustration with some members of your far right flank and some outside groups you've used words like knuckleheads and some other words we probably can't use on television. Probably. <laughs> um, had you just had enough? And how will anything be different for the next No, no I, I, let me tell you, uh, I would not describe it as, uh, as, as having had enough. And that's not it at all. Uh, When you're the Speaker of the House, uh, your number one responsibility is to the institution. And, uh, and having a vote like this in the institution, uh, I don't think is very healthy. And so uh, I've done everything I can uh, over the, my term as Speaker to strengthen the institution. Uh, and, and frankly, my move today uh, is, a, is another step in that effort to strengthen the institution. But won't the next Speaker face the same thing? Uh, hopefully not. That's my question, Mr. Speaker. How will Washington be different because you leave this institution? What, what should people watching this expect the House and Congress to do going forward if you're not here? Well, if, we, if the Congress stays focused on the American people's priorities, there will be no problem at all. And, uh, and while we have differences between Democrats and Republicans, uh, the goal here as one of the leaders is to find the common ground. Listen, I talked to President Bush and President Obama this morning. Uh, I've talked to all my legislative uh, uh, leaders, who I have a very good relationship with all of them. Because at the end of the day, the leaders have to be able to work with each other, trust each other, uh, to find the common ground to get things done. Uh, and uh, so if the Congress stays focused on what is important to the American people, they'll get along just fine.
Can you tell us how the how your conference reacted to the news? Oh, I say they were shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Can you Surprise. elaborate a little more on that? Maybe how the leadership itself reacted? Yeah, I told Mr. McCarthy uh, about uh, two minutes before I spoke what I was going to do. I told him five times because he didn't believe me. <laughs> I said, you better believe me. Should McCarthy be the next speaker? Uh, listen, I'm not going to be here to vote uh, on the next speaker, but uh, uh, that's up to the members. Uh, but having said that, I think that Kevin McCarthy would make an excellent speaker. Yes, who was the first person you told, and what did they say? Wow. Well, I told my wife. What would she say? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I told my chief, my chief of staff and I talked late yesterday, and I told him I was thinking that today might be the day. And uh, I told him I'd sleep on it. So uh, before I went to sleep last night, I told my wife, I said, you know, I might just uh, make an announcement tomorrow. Well, what do you mean? What kind of announcement? Well, I might just tell them it's time to go. So uh, this morning I woke up and uh, walked up to Starbucks as usual and got my coffee and came back and read and walked up to Pete's Diner and saw everybody at Pete's and got home and thought, yep, I think today's the day. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, my senior staff was having a meeting at uh, 8.45 and kind of walked in before I opened the house and told them, uh, this is the day. <laughs> it's going to happen someday. Well, why not today? Do you know when the next election might be held? I uh, know. Paul. Um, what advice will you give Kevin McCarthy based on your five years? What advice do you give him to avoid the same pitfalls that you've come across? Well, uh, I'll tell Kevin, uh, if, if he's the next speaker, that his number one responsibility is to protect the institution. It, it, nobody, nobody else around here has an obligation like that. Uh, secondly, I tell him the same thing I've just told you. If you just do the right thing every day for the right reasons, the right things will happen. Uh, you all know me. Uh, my colleagues know me. I'm always straight with them. You know, they may not like the answer they get, but they'll get an honest answer every single time they come to my office. Uh, it's just an easy way for me to do my job. You didn't originally um, plan to announce this on your birthday. And if it wasn't the Pope, what factors sort of weighed in on your decision to do this now? Uh, just all the, uh, this uh, stuff I read about in the paper. and <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's... Uh, I, I really don't want to hurt the institution hurt, and I don't want my colleagues hurt. I don't want I don't want to put my colleagues through all this for what? So, yes. What are you, what are you gonna miss? Pardon me. What will you miss? What will I miss? <laughs> well, of course, all of you. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I'm gonna miss because I haven't missed it yet. But uh, uh, I'll certainly miss the camaraderie of the house. You know, I. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you another story uh, that uh, was really kind of interesting. Maxine Waters and I, uh, Democrat from Southern California, uh, came here uh, 25 years ago in the same class. Now, you know, there's nothing about my politics and Maxine Waters' politics that's even anywhere close. Uh, but uh, yesterday, about 5.30, she called my office. I got a note that she called, so I called her back. And... Uh, <laughs> And she said, you know, I've, kind of, I've watched you for 25 years here. We came here together and watched uh, your career and uh, watched you today. And she says, I just want to tell you something. I'm really proud of you. You know, uh, listen, I've got the best relationships on both sides of the aisle uh, because uh, I treat people fairly and treat them honestly. And, uh, and but it's, I'm going to miss, uh, certainly miss my colleagues. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um to go back to the theme of trying to take turmoil out of the house and stabilize the institution, how, how do you think that um, it can become, become more stable? Several Republicans I talked to today from your conference said they don't think a new speaker will mean any new outcome, especially with an untested leader, maybe untested leadership. How could it become more stable? As I mentioned earlier, the fact that I did this uh, with my colleagues this morning um, then we proceeded to have an hour and a half uh, conversation. Uh, I thought was a was a unifying moment, and 
Uh, between uh, that and uh, uh, the Pope's uh, call for living by the golden rule yesterday, Pope Springs Eternal. Speaker Boehner, can you talk about what you think your legacy is as you're leading? Well, John Boehner did say that he's not really much into legacy, so that's why we cut back here. There's just a couple of more minutes left, but we uh, actually do have the entire uh, video on our uh, YouTube page, youtube.com slash Um The thing about John Boehner, he went to Congress, he believes in doing the right thing, he gets along with everybody, or so he says, and that's actually why he kind of got into the mushy middle. You have a former Speaker of the House and Nancy Pelosi who wanted to do everything that was the best thing possible for the Democratic Party. That was her philosophy that was the lens at which she was looking at things what do we democrats want that's what we're going to get john boehner on the other hand he comes across and says well what's good for the american people not necessarily what's good for the republican party and so he tries to work with democrats and work with republicans to try to get the people's business done and i actually have to admire john boehner for that philosophy unfortunately when you have republicans who are further off to the right who are saying we want you to be more like Nancy Pelosi and fight for the stuff that we believe in that's where he gets into problems and that problem started manifesting itself even though he says I treat people equally he didn't treat um, Congressman Matthews too well he didn't uh, treat Louis Gohmert too well because Congressman Gohmert had challenged him for the speakership and so he was getting pressure and it sounded, uh, about two weeks ago, I heard that uh, Matthews had put a petition out amongst Republican colleagues to vacate the chair. And it would have required the Democrats to actually bail John Boehner out, which, may, which probably led to this decision. But the other thing that probably led to this decision was just the fact that after 20 years of trying to get the Pope here, mission accomplished he got the pope here he did everything he could in 25 years in congress personally i think 25 years in uh congress is just way too much i think you know there should be term limits that's my opinion um i hope you agree with that but you know john boehner again was looking what he thought was best for the country not necessarily for the best of the party and if you take a look at Nancy Pelosi, she wanted what was best for the party and did not necessarily work well with the Republicans. That's where we have a conflict in the way the House of Representatives is run. And I, I want to get that more in a way of explanation. And it's going to be interesting to see what life is going to be like without John Boehner as Speaker. He steps down October 30th, and that means there will be a special election for his vacant congressional seat. So. Um, Governor John Kasich, since he's from Ohio, uh, Governor Kasich will have to call the special election. I probably would anticipate that being around the first of the year. And then in November, the House Republicans all meet together anyway, and that's most likely when they will be choosing their new speaker designee. I am not sure if this actually has to go back in front of the full House of Representatives or not. That I'm unsure of in, the, uh, pol in this policy. And I, it's been a long time since I've had to deal with, uh, I think it's maybe Tom Foley. Well, there's a few other speakers who had left early. I just cannot remember uh, exactly what happened there. But that's something we can talk about on another day because right now we actually have another retirement. This one is actually of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, we're running a little bit short on time right now, and so we're not going to show the speeches that were given, all the platitudes, because he did something really unique and something that was really impressive. And I actually talked to a couple people who served under him years ago, and they said that's just the way he is. The guy has a really great voice. So uh, General Martin Dempsey, the 18th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, retired and left in song. And let's take a look at how he did. The most important elements of a military unit 
At the center of our formation is an Armed Forces Color Guard bearing the national color and the service flags of the Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your full name. I, Joseph Francis Dunford, Jr. Having been appointed the 19th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Having been appointed the 19th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. That I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Of the office upon which I am about to enter. Of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. At this time, Secretary Carter is presenting the United States flag to General Dempsey for his, his faithful service to his country. This flag was flown over the Pentagon and Arlington National Cemetery in honor of his retirement and distinguished service to the nation. The current chairman shares with me the duty to love and respect those who defend this country. To advise the commander in chief with candor, carry out his orders, with excellence and share just a bit of the enormous weight he bears. It is a deep honor to join you as we pay tribute to a singular leader for our military and our nation and one of the finest men that I know. Ladies and gentlemen, as we bid farewell to the Dempseys, we ask the chairman to assist us in singing the parting glass. You know, anybody can sing that song with all those people standing behind you. <laughs> and we cut away to this, and, and not in right, any. We'll get you out of the rain here in a second. Objection to the, the president, just because we're running short on time right now. You've got to hear this. All the money that e'er I had, I spent it in good company. And all the harm that e'er I've done, alas, it was to none but me. And all I've done for want of wit to memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Goodbye and joy be to you all. So fill to me a parting glass and drink a health whatever befalls and gently rise and softly call goodbye and joy be to you all For all Comrades that e'er I've had their are And we're just gonna let this fade out as we listen to the music. Away. That's our show and for this week. All the memories that e'er I've had. Here's a parting they glass wish to you. me one more day to stay. We'll see you next week. But since it fell unto my lot that I should rise and you should not. I'll gently rise and softly call goodbye.